Welcome to Pass It On, Connecting Soul to Soul, a podcast introducing you to courageous souls. These people are taking their spark in life and passing it on, lighting their corner of the world. I'm your host, Tammy Stirr, best-selling author, speaker, and CEO of Author My Day, a company inspiring courage. I interview people about how they exercise their courage muscle and use their story to inspire you to live with a courageous heart. Let's get started with today's guest. Janet Schweitzer has been at the forefront of generating revenue for authors, media personalities, and small businesses for more than 30 years. Janet has been the secret weapon and strategic advisor behind some of the most successful authors, trainers alive today, including Jack Canfield of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, social media personalities, the Ula guys, banking industry expert, Roxanne Emmerich, motivational speaker, Les Brown, underground business guru, Jay Abraham, and tapping theory founder, Dr. Roger Callahan. These have all been her high profile clients, plus 21 other New York Times bestselling authors, as well as renowned motivational speakers, top industry leaders, dynamic internet gurus, and respected coaches and consultants. Today, she's also the New York Times and USA Today bestselling co-author of The Success Principles, a book I keep close by on my shelf at all times. This has been published in 41 languages. 41 Languages, Helping You How to Get from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. She is also the number one best-selling author of Instant Income, Strategies That Bring in the Cash for Small Businesses, Innovative Employees, and Occasional Entrepreneurs, published not only in English, but also throughout Asia. Her books, newsletters, and training courses are read and used by authors, coaches, and entrepreneurs in 100-plus countries. Janet has traveled to nearly every continent, speaking to thousands of entrepreneurs, independent sales professionals, corporate employees, and industry association members on the principles of success and income generation. She has been widely published. She has been a widely published journalist, beginning her professional career as a political campaign specialist for a member of the United States of Congress before she was age 20. And my soul-to-soul connection with Janet comes through 4-H. She was a member of 4-H clubs and a 20-year volunteer developing youth to reach their highest potential as a 4-H alum. Welcome, Janet. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on today. Gosh, I'm delighted. And uh, as you mentioned, we hit it off right away, kindred spirits, um, because of the 4-H connection. But I, what I find is so interesting, I, and I hope we get to talk about this a little bit, um, is the 4-H alumni that I meet are doing amazing things, amazing things out in the world. So kudos to you and thank you for having me on. Absolutely. And I agree with you. And when I met you a year ago last week, because when I met you, um, it was there was something right away. And then when you introduced yourself at the opening as somebody that had showed livestock, I think it was sheep, if I remember. Mm -hmm. right. I'm like, she so, has to be 4 yeah, It had to be, right? Yeah. So, Gina, describe that life um, as a child and how you learned to be courageous enough to take all these opportunities that you have in life. Yeah. Well, actually, I I was not very brave. I was not a courageous child. I was not one of those kids that were getting into everything and oh gosh, what's that? So that's so interesting. Even though I had the interest, I was actually quite fearful. I was fearful of anything new, meeting a new person, being in a new situation, being in a new, a, a different building I'd never been in before. Um, all the way, I want to say until about age eight or nine. And it, it, um, the, unusually though, it didn't really limit me um, because I, was smart enough to know I have very smart parents. <laughs> so I got, yeah. I got some really good DNA, um, but I was smart enough to know that the life that I wanted was beyond that fear. I had to, I had to, I had to take action and move beyond. I had to meet that person. I had to, you know, um, experience that, you know, new experience. And I think what really um, informed me as a young person about the great life that was 
out there waiting for me is that I was a terrific reader. My mom was a librarian. Um, she used to bring stacks of books home from the library. I was reading by the time I was four years old. I mean, books at four years old. Wow. And I would read the whole stack. And then she'd take the stack back to the library that week and bring another one the next week. Uh, I was voracious. And in fact, in kindergarten at age five, I remember we had this contest. It was a reading contest. And for each book you read, you got a construction paper, a colorful circle to add to a, a caterpillar that was around the wall. And by the time the, the reading contest was over, my caterpillar extended around three walls of the kindergarten room. And the next closest uh, student there was about one wall, literally. Wow. Um, so I was ab absolutely voracious. So I, I did realize there's some really cool things going on out there. Um, and I was also, um, I was smart. So like I said, I got some great DNA. And um, so that made me a bit of a, you know, one of those annoying overachievers. I really just wanted to excel at everything. But guess what? In order to excel at everything, you have to be courageous. You have to get into new situations. You have to learn new things. Um, I was always good at school, always right, right out of the gate, um, straight A student. And so I said, you know, something, something has to give here. When I was uh, 10, when I was 10 years old, I joined 4-H and I really didn't get into, I really didn't consciously say, oh, 4-H is a thing. Let me go do that. Um, it's actually that my sister, my sister uh, desperately wanted to raise horses. She wanted to have a horse, but we lived in town. So that was not possible um, at that time. But she found out from a friend that she could raise a lamb for the county fair for two months and we could keep it in our backyard. Um, well, during the two months, she decides to go stay with our cousins on their farm in Missouri. And guess who had to take care of the lamb? Uh, <laughs> so I was hooked. I was really hooked by that. And um, I said, wow, this this 4-H thing, is this is pretty cool. Um, so I jumped in with both feet. Um, and what was really great about it is 4-H, um, really the motto is learn by doing. Um, so you are really hands-on with everything. I learned um, not only how to care for a lamb, how to show a lamb at the county fair. Of course, you got to be on the sawdust in the show ring in front of all those people and a judge is asking you questions potentially and all these things. So I had to really, you know, get over it at that point. Um, but the other thing is I was very competitive. I said, wow, this is really an outlet for me to shine. Um, like I said, over, and I would, I think you would say this the most overachievers. You're one of them. Like we want to, we want to push the envelope. Like how good can we do? How far can we take this? Mm -hmm. Um, and 4-H, my goodness, um, public speaking competitions and record keeping competitions and the county fair and dress review, which was what they called the, for the clothing and textiles, the sewing group, um, all of that. It was like, what, goodness, what more is there? This is super fun. And I, I really, really loved it. Um, what I, I think what's so unique about 4-H, I don't see really anywhere else in any other youth organization. And that is the opportunity for leadership at a very young age. Mm -hmm. um, I think I chaired, I was going to say, my, I chaired my first countywide event when I was 14 years old. I was in the Floriculture Project, which is flower arranging. And we decided to do a countywide flower show. And of course I had a lot of help from adults and a committee that I was officially the chairman of that event. Um, when I was 17, um, <clears throat> pardon me, I chaired the junior livestock task force at the California State Fair. The wow. entire livestock division of the California State Fair, um, the volunteers for that, the, the juniors, I mean, the, the kids, Mm -hmm. were under my jurisdiction at 17 years of age. Like you can't find that anywhere. You cannot find that anywhere. Um, I was a 4-H all-star. Of course, uh, for those of you who are listening, it's um, the top rank. Uh, uh, there's only Diamond Star above that, but it's the top rank in your county. Um, and it's the kids that go around. It's um, a small group, very small group. You have to apply, be interviewed, all of that. And you put on... Um, uh, uh, some of the events, you do awards programs, all these kinds of things in conjunction with your advisor. 
so I of course knew uh, from a very young age, all star, like, what's that? I like, I want that. And mm -hmm. so, and, and that's, I think that's a great thing about 4-H too, is this um, you see the older kids. So the younger kids see these older role models and say, wow, I want to step into what they're doing because what they're doing looks fun and very cool. So kind of a long answer to your short question about, um, you know, developing courage. But I, I think that 4-H really, I mean, people ask me this question, what really got you early on in your life? What did you do early on in your life to get to where you are? Hands down, it was 4-H. Absolutely. Hands down. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I'm the same way because I'm an introvert and my mom forced me <laughs> to be in the speech contest at eight years old. And I cried through that speech. And now all of a sudden I'm out giving speeches across the United States. Exactly. And where else are, is, is that opportunity going to be there to take somebody and help them shine? Yeah. And it did for you. Is your sister older or younger than you? She's older. A couple of years older than me. Yeah. She got stuck. Her <laughs> uh, well, interestingly enough, um, this is on the list of 10 things you would never know about Janet Schweitzer unless she told you, um, <laughs> or I found out on this podcast. Um, we actually ended up raising registered Suffolk sheep. So, uh, for decades, literally decades, about 30, 32 years, I want to say. Um, and it, uh, it all came about because, uh, we were showing uh, sheep competitively, my sister and I. Um, and there really weren't, um, the, the quality of animals, uh, that we were looking for the type of animals for show, um, in our County, um, or even near in nearby counties. And so we said, you know, we, we probably should start breeding our own and see mm -hmm. what we can do better. Um, and this is, this is teenagers, you know, 14, 15 years old. And, um, I, I I call our our hobby flock. We had about forty registered Suffolk brood ewes. Um, it it kind of was a four H project run amok, actually. So <laughs> once I aged out of four H, which as many of you listening know, it's uh, age nineteen. Um, we kept with it, and we were on the she the senior show circuit. So I showed animals um, our our breeding stock all over the Western United States as far East. I, I was, I grew up in California, Southern California. And so um, all the County fairs, the senior shows up and down the state, but as far East as um, the Midwest stud Ram sale, which was in Sedalia, Missouri, we were well known actually for our range Rams our commercial range Rams. So these are yearling Rams that would be bought to um, run with the U flocks in, in these huge commercial fat lamb herds um, where they're they're growing uh, market lambs basically for the the commercial market the lambs you find in the grocery store basically so very we had very popular range rams they got sold into Mexico even for that wow. um, so that was that was super fun we had some national awards. Um, yeah. And uh, certainly some state regional awards, things like that. So, but it was super fun. Um, as as things happened, though, uh, my sister kind of took it over because my my career was going a, a different direction, and um, I didn't really want to take all my vacation time and go to you know, <laughs> shows in Bakersfield. Not that Bakersfield isn't amazing; it is, but you know, Bakersfield, Fresno, Colorado. I mean, all these different places. Um, I wanted to be doing other things with my time. So that was really kind of, kind of how it, uh, how I stepped out of it. Uh, interestingly enough though, um, my niece, um, who also grew up in 4-H, um, I was her show coach and she was on the club lamb circuit, which we didn't have when I was younger, but that's where these are independent live sh stock shows. You, have, you don't have to be in 4-H or FFA right. or any other program. And you could just show, and they were going on, my goodness, almost every weekend from January to June. Um, and so 10 to 14 weekends a year uh, during the first half of the year, I would be up and down the state with her at, at shows and helping her with her uh, her club lambs. So, and she got the same benefits out of 4-H, I think that I do. Confident, um, she's a, a real go-getter. She's in a career she loves, it's in agriculture articulate. I mean, just every, all, all the things that 4-H can do for a kid. 
she got those in spades. So um, it, it, it generally generationally, you know, it, it, uh, it does continue on. So um, I have a pretty large following of 4-H people, obviously, I and mean, they'll probably be watching this. So I'm going to say, what is one piece of advice that you have for that 4 her in the show ring with their lamb, their cattle, their cat, their dog, whatever they're in the show ring? What is your one piece of showmanship advice so they can walk home with that showmanship trophy? Um, I would say practice in advance. Actually, I have two pieces of advice. Practice, practice, practice. And it doesn't take a long time, maybe 10 minutes a day. Get a coach early on to help you hold it and hold your animal in the right position, um, make your moves correctly, all of that. But the best piece of advice I can give to anyone is show up looking like you're going to win. I can't tell you how many times my niece walked into the show ring and ended up winning first place in her class sometimes grand champion, often grand champion, actually. Um, she was a real winner. Um, but how many times the judges said, that girl walked into this show ring expecting to win this class. So that level of confidence, it shows. It shows in how you hold your animal, how you, I don't want to say stare down the judge, but you connect you know, with the judge. Like, I know what I'm doing here. Pick me. Yeah. It really it, it, when, when she was when she was younger, uh, she was in showmanship um, and she decided to get um, a tiny little lamb, actually, um, because she really wanted to win showmanship. That was her goal for that year. Market didn't really matter. She had winning reserve grand with the lamb, but, <laughs> you know, showmanship was really her thing. And that judge who was from Texas. What a nice guy. He said, this girl looked like she 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 came in the show ring to win. She looked like she was a winner and she looked like she was going to give me what for if she didn't win. And he said, she's first in our class today. So it's, it's that, I mean, I think you sort of exude, you, you sort of telescope um, that confidence, but you have to back it up with the fact that you actually do know what you're doing. Yeah. So. Um, and that can transfer into a job interview. Yeah. Anyway, that can anyway. transfer into scholarship interviews like just show up as if the job is yours. Show up as if the scholarship is yours. Yeah. I love that advice. Yeah. I, I think that positive expectation, the expectation of winning, it's not entitlement. It's not a sense of entitlement. It's I've done the work. I'm here to win. As Les Brown says, be in it to win it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I've, I've done the work. I'm here to win. I'm going to show up and do everything I need to do. Um, interestingly enough, i I haven't told this story to too many people, but um, my niece was a junior. She was moving into the senior division uh, the next year. And she came to me and she said, auntie, I, I think I know how I can win showmanship next year. And she was going to be competing against all the older teenagers. And she's, she's a tiny little thing, actually, a little kid. And I said, oh, really, how? And she said, well, I think if I can get more time on the sawdust and show more throughout the year, I can I can win. And that's when she started. Um, I didn't know about the whole club lamb circuit. That's, but she had done all the research. Mm. And I said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll do this. I'll do this with you. I'll help you." And so um, she showed all, all winter and spring. And by the time she got to the fair, she was so seasoned. I mean, she was so mm. probably she'd probably shown more times in one year than all of those teenagers had shown in their entire county fair careers. And I remember um, the judge kind of singled her out and brought her over to a spot in the show ring and said, you know, stand here. And, th and then he worked with all the other kids in the arena. She had no idea, like, why am I, am I being punished? Why am I over there? And, but she knew, keep showing, keep showing, keep showing. And at the very end, he placed a whole class and then he pulled her out and put her right at the top of the class. And he explained to the audience, um, all the, the parents, the people in the stands that were looking, why, um, what about her showing was so different that he wanted to put her on display, basically, for, for everyone else. Um, prior to her going on the Club Lamb circuit, I called, this is another 
thing on the list of 10 things you don't know about Janet. <laughs> I, was, I was on the livestock judging team at UC Davis, which is my alma mater. Okay. I was not studying. I was not studying animal science. I was getting an international relations and economics degree, <laughs> but I had enough experience to be on the livestock judging team and I traveled with the team, but my old ju judging team coach, when she first wanted to um, do club lambs, I said, well, let's call him and ask him all the questions. So he actually invited her up um, over the Christmas vacation um, in between Christmas and New Year's to work with the school shepherd who was one of the top showmen in California. And she did a little uh, showmanship workshop showing my niece the new style. This is this is my point, get a coach, get somebody, work with someone who knows. And, and, it, and by the way, I, I'm, I'm hopefully I don't offend project leaders out there, but it may not be your project leader, the, the, right, the right coach for you. Mm -hmm. may not be your project leader anyway. So, um, and I filmed the little showmanship instruction that the, the, um, this top showman did with my niece and she watched it over and over and over and over again, and then practiced the, the stance and the driving, you know, getting your lamb to drive and setting the legs and all of that. Um, 10, 10 minutes a day at, at the, and it doesn't take hours the animals don't last that long, you know, every single day, but just 10 minutes to get, get your animal um, driving the way you want and setting the way you want and jacked up the way you want. And, you know, all of that just is really important. So how do you go from working uh, or leading the livestock show at the California state fair at age 17 to a political campaign in Washington, DC at age 19? Yeah. 4-H. Yeah, 4-H. Because one of the things that 4-H has, I, I hope they still have it. Um, they have a whole program. It's a national program called Government Focus. Um, at the time, they also had, they had a government focus and a world focus. And that's where your state, you, you could know, be part of a state delegation. So there's about 30 kids from California. We went back to Washington. And um, when you're on Capitol Hill there, you learn about... Um, how government works and um, advocacy and all of these things. Um, world focus, we actually ended up going to the United Nations in New York before we jumped down to Washington. Oh. Me, and we met with ambassadors. Well, here's that, that was a 4-H program, but I knew uh, going into it, I'd already been um, accepted in the program. I'd apply for it and all that. But part of it is you, when you're on Capitol Hill, uh, you meet with your, your member of Congress. And I said, Oh, okay. Well, I know that's kind of weird. You know, just like meeting. And I had a, I had a woman Congress woman, Bobby Fiedler was our rep um, at the time for, for the district I lived in. Mm -hmm. I said, well, that's kind of weird. I don't really want to meet her for the first time that day. Why don't I figure out how I can meet her ahead of, ahead of going to Washington? Hmm. So there was, as luck would have it, there was a Christmas party for a local political group. And I talk about courage. I, I wasn't so courageous. I got my mom to go with me. I said, mom, come on, let's go. <laughs> let's go and do this. And so I met her and um, she asked me to volunteer for her campaign. Actually, it was, and because what's interesting is these campaigns um, never really go dark. Uh, in, in the United States here, the House of Representatives is reelected every two years. So during the interim year, they're still doing things, fundraising and mm -hmm. meetings and all kinds of things for the campaign. Anyway, so she, she um, uh, invited me to volunteer for her campaign, which I did. Um, and then she got reelected, um, very popular member of Congress in our district. And then uh, because the campaign never really get, went dark, uh, she needed somebody to manage the campaign during the interim year, you know, get the fundraising letters out and all of these things. Uh, well, she hired me to do that. And so I, um, as part of that, um, she said, you know what, why don't you come on, come to Washington, uh, for a time and, and be on, um, congressional staff at my office. Wow. That was super cool. That was just really, I mean, I loved, I loved the work. Um, it's one of the most exciting things I've ever done. I think if I ever, um, retired from the publishing industry, I'd probably go back into politics, but <laughs> super, super fun. I mean, just meeting, um, 
uh, the, the people you get to meet and they're all just sort of like there, you know, there would be, um, she, she would do some, uh, campaign events, um, back in Washington. Then I put my campaign hat on cause you know, you're I'm not supposed to be a staffer and be campaigning, but anyway, so I would, I would show up to these parties and there was, Oh, the secretary of the interior. Let me, let me go meet him or, um, secretary of transportation or, um, they, you know, they attended some of these events. So I think, um, I mean, it was really all due to the fact that I was supposed to go back to Washington with my 4-H group and my goodness, look at the door that opened, um, in front of me with, with that, with that. I think it's fascinating how so many people wait for opportunity to come to them, but you went and opened up the door of opportunity. I didn't know it was going to be a door. I just wanted to go meet. I just thought it was a good idea to go meet her, but that, I mean, that's how life works, right? You, you, you take a little bit of action and you create some momentum for yourself. Um, there's a really good analogy uh, from Buckminster Fuller who says, um, you as we move through our life, we're, we're like a speedboat and behind us and to the, the sides of us is a, a wake of activity. And we may never know because it's behind us, right? But we may never know what that touches or what that creates. Our only job is to be the speedboat. So that's, you know, my first piece of advice for everybody listening, be the speedboat and things will happen because that's really how momentum is created. Um, uh, and, um, a, a lot of, People ask me, you know, Janet, how have you built such a successful career? And oftentimes my answer is, I'm not really sure I have um, done that. What I've done is when a door opens in front of me, I've had the courage to step through that doorway and say, you know, let's let's look at this. Let's um, let's let's test this out. Let's lean into this and um, and see what that looks like. And if that's something that that is, is interesting to me. And what I find is when I do take that step through a doorway that opens up, and by the way, for those of you listening, the, the key is here to recognize open doorways when they, when they open it for recognize an opportunity for what it is. Um, and some things you try and don't, you know, they don't quite work out. That's okay too. Cause you always learn something. You can never learn less. Right. Right. Um, but Oftentimes stepping through that doorway, a whole new world opens, opens up in front of you, all kinds of new opportunities that you never would have had before. If you didn't, you know, sort of exercise that little, that little bit of courage, get over whatever fear you have and just exercise your courage muscle. Right. <laughs> so right, out. Out. right out. As you know, as long as it's not dangerous, as long as it's mm -hmm. not, you know, putting you in physical harm, harm's way mm -hmm. or whatever, but yeah, by and large, um, that's that's been. I think my career has been a series of open doors. More, I mean, l later, of course, I, I'm sort of like, okay, I want to make that thing happen. What do I have to do to go make that that mm -hmm. uh, happen in my career? Um, but even with that, I can tell you, doors open. I did interestingly. Um, I was working on something just the other day, and um, somebody out of the blue, like literally out of the blue, called me and said, "Hey." would you like to do a Ted talk? And I went, I think that could work for what I'm doing. Yeah. Great. Wow. So it's, amazing. it's amazing what shows up. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. I also think it's the um, power of attraction and yeah. like you advise all these people on the secret, right? You're one of their strategists. You get this. And what's funny is I was just looking at my vision board today and I had Ted talk on there and I'm like, Ooh, I don't have any goals set around that. I need to figure out how to start taking action towards it. And then you bring this up and I'm like, oh, that's the power of attraction. <laughs> exactly. So, so Gina, tell us about your career now and what do you love about the work you do? Well, I, it, it's been a great career. I mean, I've been at this over 30 years, uh, 35 years actually at this point. Um, and there's a, there's a couple of things that just really still fascinate me and have fascinated me from the beginning. And that's, um, the ability that that's, that's the, the idea that you can write something, you can produce something, you can speak a lesson, you can develop a curriculum and people who you may never meet 
millions of people benefit from that. I mean, personally, I, I think my my own personal mission is to expand knowledge in the world. I've always thought that. Um, I think it's kind of cool that I ended up um, in a in a position to be able to to do that and in, in, in impact literally generations of people. I mean, the the success principles, the the book that it's on right there on your bookshelf. Um, Jack Canfield and I are very proud of this. It was uh, named the number one success classic. So it's over other success books that you might have heard, The Seven Habits and Good to Great and and those. And all of them on my bookshelf. It's yeah, awesome. yeah. They, oh, they're, they're, they're all the friends. That's right. Um, so we're we're very proud of that. But that book, uh, the the twenty year anniversary edition of that book is coming out next year in twenty twenty five. So if you think about it, 20 years of people in 41 languages re reading that book and what what's so, um, I mean, sometimes as an author, you don't really know what the, the impact has been until you start getting feedback from readers. And I think for me, um, when Jack and I did the, all the revisions for the 10 year anniversary edition, we, um, emailed his and surveyed his list to um, get stories uh, for the new book. Oh my gosh, the stories that we got in of people who had overcome uh, physical disabilities, um, injuries, uh, hardships, unimaginable hardships, prison terms. I mean, just the, if you think of the broad um, sort of nature of society, every kind of person, every kind of situation that's out there, we've seen be impacted by um, by that book in particular. And so it's a very heady thing to be um, a, a, a writer um, and then also somebody who uh, kind of espouses, I live the success principles, um, but I love writing about personal development work um, and you know, strategies and exercises and um, mindset and all of these different things. So that's what I really love uh, about my career is that I, I'm able to do my work, what I love to do. And yet it impacts all of these people, literally millions of people in over, over a hundred countries now. Um, and I think the other thing that I really love about my work is mm, in a way there's, there's like, there's no competition necessarily as competitive as I am. It sounds kind of funny, but <laughs> literally everybody has every author that I work with, everybody that I meet, you, I mean, other people, um, they have their own take on things. They have their own spin on what personal development is and how to, how to, how to get there, what achievement looks like and how to get there. Um, so there's really, it's not like bricks and mortar businesses where you're fighting, you know, fighting tooth and nail to gain market share of, you know, a, a above and beyond the bricks and mortar guy down the street. It's not like that. It's just so fascinating. Um, so everybody can, you know, um, uh, show up on the New York times list the same week and still go have dinner together. Right. <laughs> But also um, what I think what fascinates me is the material that I've gotten to work with. I, I learn so much. I'm a never ending learner, constant learner. I always love learning new things. And um, it's, I, I mean, in a way um, over 35 years, I started in the personal development world um, almost when it was in his infancy. I mean, we had the greats. Norman Vincent Peale and, you know, some of those in the seventies and eighties, but mainstream um, uptake of personal development, personal growth, self-help, I think really came into its own in kind of in the late eighties. Mm -hmm. And so I've gotten to watch an entire industry grow up and mature, certainly here in the United States. Um, worldwide, of course, we see um, other regions of the world lagging by a few years or even several years behind the United States in the material that we bring out. But for for example, now, you know, there's there's all the kinds of success principles that Jack Canfield and I have written and my other author clients have written about over the years. 
but now there's a whole new area of personal growth. It's, and it's all related to brain science mm-hmm. and how the, that the brain body connection and uh, brain spirit, you know, all of these things, how to, how to get the most out of your brain, brain longevity, all of these things. So um, there's quantum quantum theory is now coming into its own, of course, um, in the, in the personal development world. So there's, there's always something new to learn. It's always fun and really cool people. So that's kind of what I, lo- what I love about my, uh, about my career. It's been, it's been fun. And, and of course, just from a, from a personal standpoint, um, being in- independent, doing what I do independently, I'm not working for a company and I, I have a company, but, um, the good news is I own the business. The bad news is I own the business, yeah, right. um, but I I've gotten to create the lifestyle that I want. So this, this like work from home remote, all I've been doing that for over 30 years. Um, it's, it's really a thing now, but it's enabled me to travel to, uh, you know, four different continents, um, dozens of countries, um, be there for my niece when she's showing her lambs, you know, on a Thursday night or a Friday afternoon or something. Yeah. So just a very cool lifestyle as well. Absolutely. So you already kind of hinted towards like these changes that you've seen in the industry. Um, so as a business strategist for these authors and celebrities and entrepreneurs, what trend do you think people need to be showing more courage around than what they're showing fear right now? Um, artificial intelligence, mm-hmm. actually. Yeah. Because I think um, if, for, a, for a couple of years now, I think chat GPT that came out in November 2022, took the world by storm. Um, but still to this day, there's a little bit of, oh, uh, AI is a job crusher. It's, uh, it'll put humans out of business. You know, it'll, it'll, um, it'll change life as we know it. Maybe so. And maybe, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we need, uh, uh, you know, AI to do more of the work so that we have as humans, we have more time to grow individually, to spend time with family, to reach goals that um, are are unreachable, we think at, at this point in our lives. So AI is a tool like any other tool. It's nothing, nothing to fear. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I was talking to one of my clients the other day. He's in the medical industry and he was speaking at a medical conference and the general tenor of the audience was that AI is just super bad. And he asked for a, a show of hands, how many, how many people out in the audience have a chat GPT account and, you know, a few, and he encouraged them that night at the conference in their hotel rooms to it's free, go get a chat GPT account, just play around with it. See what it will literally in uh, overnight, the whole vibe of the group changed they thought it was one of the most amazing things they'd ever seen. Um, And so if you educate yourself and read up on what AI can do, what it is already doing, it's helping pathologists um, do a better job of identifying cancer cells on a slide. It's helping, um, it's helping uh, writers do research that um, things they never would have been able to find out on Google with days and days of, you know, searching for studies and, and all these things. So it's a, it's a tool. It is a tool. Um, so authors, speakers, coaches out there, don't, don't be afraid of it. Start, you know, jumping in and, and playing around with it. Um, chat GPT, of course, like I said, you could get a free account. There's a paid version as well, but then there's also other, uh, Generative AI, it's called, where um, artificial intelligence is generating something for you, video, audio, um, written material, of course. Um, So generative AI, there's a lot of software programs out there that might be appropriate for your industry. Let's say you're an author in a a niche market, for example, Um, and it can, um, because it's trolling vast data sets out there and it can learn. I mean, not only can it analyze, but it can learn as well. Um, potentially faster than you, sorry to say, faster than humans. Um, right. But it's, I say, I would say the one thing to get over, get over it is it's here. It's going to be here for a long time. And, and you might actually consider, well, wow. Okay. As an author, 
a coach, a trainer, uh, in order to market myself, I have to create vast amounts of content out there, perpetual content. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're on the road speaking. You don't have time to do that. Sometimes you uh, don't have the budget to hire a staff to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, you can program in a few, um, uh, a few prompts is what's called prompt engineering. You write what you were looking for and chat GPT or any other software. There's other software uh, programs paid for. Um, it can write a year's worth of social media content for you, literally. Right. right. So, um, of course, you'll review it, make sure it says exactly what you want it to say. And there's not some weird Frankenstein words in there. But, mm -hmm. you know, by and large, uh, it's a tool. It's a tool for, for authors. I was working on social media posts and I'm like, I wonder if I can do this for three months out. And so I put my prompt in there of what I wanted and then that I wanted um, I think it was like two a week. So it was like 24 or something like that, that I wanted. And it, yeah, it whipped it out and it gave me a little bit different spin. I um, mean, though I was promoting the same book every single time and it saved me hours and hours of work, but I was still able to go back and make up my own. Exactly. That yeah. And, and the, yeah. And I think the thing is too, um, we know from marketing that, you get tired of your material a lot sooner than the marketplace does. Um, and for you to rewrite and rewrite and, and different spin, and now it's a different topic today and all these things, that's, uh, that can be a drag for a lot of, a lot Absolutely. of Absolutely. So having a friend called AI <laughs> help you is, um, is, you know, it's a good thing. Absolutely. Okay. We have to get to our courage questions. Yeah, right. So Janet, how do you define courage and why does courage matter? Well, I I think for me, courage is the definition for me um, would be uh, facing fear with confidence, mm -hmm. facing fearful situations with confidence, um, resilience, um, and it's not the absence of fear. I think Taylor Swift has a really cool quote. Fearlessness is not the absence of fear. Um, but recognizing that that's, yeah, I've got that. I got that feeling. I'm experiencing that, that experiencing that emotion, but I know there's something better on the other side of, um, uh, of fear. So there's a great quote in the success principles that says, um, everything you want is just beyond your comfort zone. So get out of your comfort zone. So, however, there's the confidence piece of courage. Um, and if my definition is, uh, if my, uh, uh, my definition of courage is to face your fears and uh, with confidence and move beyond them, um, well, where does that confidence come from? It comes from, like we were talking about before H, learn by doing get multiple experiences under your belt of that thing that you need to do. Take little baby steps. Hey, if you want to go launch into a new career, find out, can I intern somewhere? Can I tag along with a, a business owner who does that for the day? Can I find a mentor who's going to show me the ropes um, and help me build confidence in preparation for being in fearful situations? Um, and I think courage matters. It's, that's really a loaded question because um, people could stay small their whole lives, a small experience, living in their own little small little world, but you're not going to get um, the, the kind of life that you might envision for yourself by playing small. The world is not going to benefit by you playing small. I mean, if you think about it, there are people who... Um, who develop an event, an invention, for example, a new invention, a new piece of technology or what? Yeah. I mean, or, or they, they get into a new, um, a, a new, a new line of work or whatever and, and blossom and the world benefits from all of that. Were they fearful? Yeah, probably, probably, but, um, they had, they knew enough to get beyond that. And they also had developed confidence ahead of time. So 
that would be kind of a long answer to your short question, but that's, that's my definition. You make me think about this farmer who decided to retire and let, you know, his kids take over. And he was driving down the road one time and he noticed the corn had been hailed and this whole field had been lost. And he's like, oh. you know what? I think I can do something about that. And he went back and played with corn genetics as a retiree and then came out in his seventies. <laughs> was like this whole new expert on corn genetics and, you know, hail. And I just keep thinking if people like that play small, then like you said, the world doesn't benefit. They benefit when you understand that you have a talent that the world is depending on. Yeah. And, and I think, I think confidence also gives you a sense that I know things of value. I can do things of value. If you don't have experience, if you haven't gotten ready for the opportunity to show up, you might think, well, why would I go do that? It's nothing's going to, you know, I, who am I to go do that? What do I know? I'm not smart enough, rich enough, pretty enough. I'm not enough in fill in the blank, whatever way you say. Um, but um, developing confidence makes you feel more like a winner. Like, Hey, I, I could, I, I think I could do something about that. Just like the farmer. I think I could do something about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So talk about, I can do something about that. What spark do you want to be in the world? Um, well, I've been, a, I've been a spark already. <laughs> so happy about that. <laughs> um, I think that for me at, at this stage of my career, um, the, my, the best use of my, my time, my talent, my experience, my connections, um, is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. I've, I've done it a few times with my author clients, but I want to do a much larger way. And that is to get someone like you to replicate yourself. How do, how, I mean, if Tammy's the expert, if Tammy's the courage coach, how do we create thousands or millions of junior Tammy's out there? Um, and it's it starts with being a role model, but secondarily, it, it more important is to um, memorialize and sort of develop a curriculum. Like th this is this is who Tammy is. This is what Tammy knows to do. Um, this is how somebody can do what Tammy does out in the world. So I've done during my career. I've done this several times actually, um, where we develop coaching. A, a coaching program for somebody who is a coach, like you, you're, you're the courage coach. Right. Um, and literally train thousands of other courage coaches out there to bring your work to the masses. So, and I'm, for example, with the, I, one of these is I, I did recently, um, a couple of authors in the, in the personal de development world were coaches. They had a methodology that they developed for people changing their lives and all that. And I said, hey, why don't we, you know, sort of bundle up this curriculum and teach other people to do what you do? Because think about it, as an author, as a coach, you cannot coach all the people that need to be need it out there. You can't possibly, if you're a speaker or a trainer, you can't possibly be in front of enough audiences in your lifetime to do the work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. But you can train other people to do that. Um, and train other people to do that potentially just as well as you do it. Um, and so these two authors I was talking about, um, and this was just very recent, I developed this uh, coaching program for them um, to teach coaches um, how to be great at their methodology, uh, at the author's methodology, and then also um, not only how to be a great coach, but um, the how to, how to be um, a uh, you know, train the methodology and then also have the clients out there, these, these millions, the masses, um, a curriculum, a weekly coaching curriculum for them to go to with topics and homework assignments and videos and a, a lesson that they studied every single week. Um, and in the first month we had coaches in a, uh, once we launched it in the first month, we had coaches in 
11, 11 countries and all 50 states. Wow. And eventually grew that to 24 countries and all 50 states, four continents. So from these, just these two authors that were, they were a duo, they wrote all their books together. Mm -hmm. They are now impacting people they'll, they'll never meet ever in, in dozens of countries out there. So it's something I really like to do. I'd like to do more of it um, and um, really talk to people about what do you have that the world needs? And this is a, this is an avenue to, to get it out there in a big way. Gina, you are so intuitive. And I saw this when I met you. I, I, I was blessed by a strategy session with you. And at that moment, you were intuitive. Like my to-do list literally is two years long from 20 minutes with you. And now today, as you're saying this again, exactly what you were just saying about me, I'm like, that's exactly like, I'm going to go to the lawyer's office this afternoon to pay a bill. And I was going to ask her about trademarking the courage coach. Why not? Right. And you're sitting okay. here talking mm -hmm. about that. And my mastermind group, which came off of a business um, entrepreneur group off of success principles. And they're all trying to do exactly what you're saying. And they're looking for that guidance and they're looking for the expertise and the networks and just that intuitiveness. What a gift, what a gift you have. Yeah. Well, and we, we talked earlier about um, developing experience. I mean, I have a lot of confidence in doing this for people because I've been doing it since literally the first one of these uh, was in 1989. Uh, I was actually an employee. My last job as an employee, I worked for Jay Abraham for four years and um, we did a program uh, that was a pretty sort of a protege mentor program where um, people who wanted to learn how to become junior J. Abrahams. Uh, he was a business consultant, small business consultant. Um, they could learn all of his methodologies, uh, direct response marketing and advertising, all the different methodologies, negotiating, joint ventures, um, all the tools that he used every day as a consultant. We spent a year training, um, I think it was almost a thousand people um, nationwide to go do that. So he immediately in less than a year replicated his ability to help small businesses out there. And that was all the way back in 1989 was the first one of those that I worked on. Um, so there's, there are people that have been, uh, who want to call them gurus or certainly best-selling authors. Um, but people who've spent time in their careers developing a methodology and proving it, proving that it works out in the real world. Um, there are many, many more people. So there's, there's authors like that that have quietly done this for decades, but my goal is to help many, many more people do it now. So Janet, what will be better in the world because Janet was here? Oh gosh. Um, I, I, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think for me, um, the biggest impact I've had is, is the books that I've written. Um, if, if any, if a copy of any of the books that I've written either by myself or with other people can spark an improvement in anyone's life, then I've done my job. And it's, it's kind of like, if it was just one person that that happened, I, I'd be happy if just one person's life was turned around or changed or improved, or if or just one person went off and did something amazing um, because of what they learned out of one of my books, I'd be happy. But knowing that it's millions of people are doing that, it's, that's, the ask how's the world better by me being here. I think that's, I've really just been a catalyst for this information, really. I, I will agree with that. <laughs> My life is better because you're a catalyst of great information. You've already talked a little bit about what's next. Is there anything else you want to add to what's next? Um, well, I think, yeah, we, we definitely talked about career-wise. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting. I I'm a worker bee. I mean, I really, I don't want to say I'm a workaholic. I, I try to, you know, achieve 
uh, life work life balance. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me, um, there's a, a, a number of things that that I want to do in getting into, um, I guess, networks of it, I guess start networking because I mean I know a lot of people. Don't get me wrong, I know a lot of people, yeah. and I'm doing deals all day long, and I'm talking to people about you know projects all day long. But uh, for and, and this is important, I think, for those of you listening, there's there's there has to be a separation between your career goals and your and your life goals. I mean, for many people, their career is their life. That's okay. But at some point you're gonna say, you know what, which is the point I'm at now. I want to I, I want to be hanging out with um successful, forward thinking, um, you know, intelligent, sophisticated people that uh not necessarily think the, the way I do. That's not necessary, but that are really doing cool things. And I think that, um, you know, that old adage, we become like the five people we hang out with the most. Um, so who, who are you hanging out with? But for me, I think, um, you know, really starting to develop, um, these, these sort of small groups, um, in, in my personal life versus just my career life. I think is, is really cool. So that's, that's something that I started doing um, earlier this year, but that's, it, I'd like to grow more of that. That's Absolutely. Oh, mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. And it, it makes a difference. I mean, that's what I love about doing a podcast because I get to choose these five people who mm -hmm. I want to emulate, who I want to be my role models and find out those top 10 things. Nobody really knows about Janet and really, bring that into my life, those values, those mindsets mm -hmm. and those ideas. So thank you for being one of those people for me. Yeah, you're, you're so welcome. And I, I think too, um, it, even though being part of a group is great, it, it really, as you know, Tammy, it really starts with one person. And, um, for, for those listening, if you've never heard the term accountability partner, mm -hmm. that's, I think something everyone should have in their life. But like I have one literally. And, She's a major producer in the entertainment field. I mean, she's worked with Oprah and all the major names. Mm -hmm. um, but she has a much different perspective on my life than I would have by myself. Um, so we get to trade notes, but also she keeps me accountable for getting after those, those goals that I want. So for those of you listening, if you can find just one person who you can check in with and say, hey, let's hang out. A little more together and I'll help you. You help me and we'll create our separate goals, but then collaborate on making sure we're doing the things we need to do to, to meet those goals mm -hmm. and achieve those things. And accountability partners, I think are a game changer. I have like one for author. I have one for my speaking career and I have one for business. And so every two weeks we check in with each other and it really helps me focus. And sometimes there's overlap in that accountability partner. But for me, because like you said, being the worker bee, there's so many goals, but the accountability partner makes all the difference in the world for me. So I agree. I would agree. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you would like to add? Oh my gosh. Well, this has been fun. You, you know, I, I have to say, um, I, I do a lot of podcasts that really are about business. It's just mm -hmm. about the book trade or becoming an author mm -hmm. or whatnot. But the idea that I get to share, um, something that's near and dear to my heart, like, I mean, how to have a, have a great childhood. And I, I guess for the, the adults listening out there, um, I, I think I had such a good experience growing up in 4-H that it really, um, I, I think use the, the time when your child is, is younger to help them set goals, just like my niece, she wanted to win showmanship, help them set goals, help them be courageous, stepping into some of these new experiences. Don't be a hover. A, what is it? Helicopter parent. Don't yeah. hover. Um, let the, let your child fill in their registration for <laughs> themselves, you know, all of that. So, um, but you can't get that time back. You can't get those years back. So use them wisely um, and get your kid involved in things. I think that would be, um, the, I mean, I've, I've seen the benefit in my life of 
really immersing myself in all the things that are available, certainly through 4-H, but just in life in general. But then I replicated that too with, with my niece who's um, in her early thirties now. So just, I think that's the, the parting piece of advice I would give. Janet, thank you for being my guest today and so connecting. Helpful. It has been a pleasure. Thank you for listening and being inspired to exercise your own courage muscle. Please leave us a rating on whatever platform you are listening. For even more, you can go to www.authormyday.com. Remember, you only have this one life, this one day. So always author your day. Thanks for listening to Pass It On, connecting soul to soul.